Let's talk about a false confidence. You think you're more than you are. A lot of people think they're saved and they're not. A lot of people think they're living right and they're not. A false confidence, Matthew 7, 13 and 14, and 21 through 23. But first of all, I had a picture of a little girl up here, some of y'all might know, Faith Hill. In 2006, she, this is on YouTube if you want to watch it, she's sitting there just thrilled to death, eyelashes just about, and she knows she's going to be the winner. And she wasn't. And they got all this on film. She pitched a fit. She did not win, and she thought she would. So, that gives us an idea of a false confidence. Now, according to the Bible, many people will be lost who thought they were going to be saved. There's many people walking right now in the church itself that think they're saved. And they've slipped and don't even realize it. Can you imagine the horror of the moment, though, that faith healed? With everybody looking, I mean all the cameras and everything, falling flat on her face. It'd be embarrassing. And I don't want to experience that on Lord's Day, and I don't want to know you don't either. But can we imagine how we would feel on Lord's Day if that happened to be true? You know, when you look at Matthew 7, 13 through and 14, it says this is going to happen to a whole lot of people. There's going to be a whole lot of people. If you look at the parable of the ten virgins in your book, that represents the church, right in verse 1. Half of the church won't make it. Look it up. That ought to wake us all up. That's good like horseshoes, close but no ringer, you know? Matthew 7, 13 and 14. Enter by the narrow gate, for wide is the gate, broad is the way that leads to hell, to destruction. And there are many who go in by it. Many. Narrow is the gate. Narrow is the gate. It's a little bit harder. Difficult is the way that leads to life, and there are just a few who find it. Just a few who find it. You know, when you think about this, this is as close to home as you can possibly get. You know, you're saying that half of the church, that don't mean every single congregation, but half of the church ain't going to make it. We need to strive. We need to try to make it. Matthew 7, 21. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. But Lord, <laughs> but only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. I thought about a lot of things and I nearly didn't cut it. 22 and 23. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name? I acted like a Christian. I, I, I did this and I did that. I didn't cast out demons in your name. I did all this trying to give you the glory. No, I was trying to get the glory myself. And done many wonders in your name. And then he says, I will declare to them I never knew. It's judgment day, family. We're standing there, and the Lord looks one of us in the eye. And he says, you know what, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. To know what that means, we have to study the whole Bible the whole doctrine, and we have to do every bit of that doctrine. Not part of it. We can't pick and choose. We have to go for it with all we got. You're saying we have to be perfect. I said you have to strive to be perfect. You have to do the best you can. Let's examine how one possesses this false confidence. First of all, we overly trust people. Romans 3, 4 says, Certainly not indeed. Let God be true and every man a liar as it is written that thou may be justified in your words and may overcome when you are judged. You know, I can't think of a better example in my little finite mind than this. 
God looks me in the eye and says, depart from me, John, I never knew you. Excuse me, it's not my fault. It's his fault, her fault, their fault. Not my fault. Like I said, depart from me, I never knew you. Instead, we trust preachers. You know, I am so thankful. I see people taking notes in this congregation, write the verses down that I'm up here running my mouth about. Because see, I study very hard. I do. And I try to use book, chapter, verse every time I open my mouth. But understand something. I can be misled by my own thinking. What I understand may not be exactly the way it's meant. I may be missing the message. And some of you may be too. And we've got to be willing to not trust the preacher 100% back it up with this. Take those Scriptures home and make sure that I preached the truth. People put all their trust in their parents. Well, you have to when you're a child. But I'll tell you something. Parents are no better than preachers. They can make mistakes, not on purpose, but by misunderstanding it. By not going on a little bit farther and looking around to see exactly what it Where's the message? It says Jesus wept. So you've got to cry. Look at the message. Why did He weep? We've got compassion. He had compassion. Authors. You know, I love, love some of the commentaries out there. They tell you the history going on back then because... I don't have enough time and enough brain to find out all the little things that were going on back then. These people have. And I really enjoy reading what they've got to say. And I find out a lot. But understand something. I too take what they've said and I go to the Scripture and I have to look at it and if it really does say all these Scriptures they're applying it to, then I'm fine with it. If it don't, that's where your sermons come from a lot. They come from it a lot. This one does. You see, I read something and I thought, whoa! So I studied that. And here we are. This wasn't what I started out to do. But I was like you. I was checking what I had seen. And when I'm reading this, I thought, I've never noticed that before. We're going to do that next Wednesday night in class. Spouses. You know, I, I preach love and marriage. I mean, I love it. And the man's supposed to be the leader of the home. As long as he's leading you right down the right path. But all of us, men and women, husbands and wives, we trust each other, but we need to verify, verify, verify. Because if your spouse is misleading you and you see it's wrong, are you just going to ignore it or are you going to try to save your spouse too? I would hope you'd save, try to save your spouse too. We, we put too much stock in an authority of the church, an elder, a deacon, a preacher, a teacher, or a bona fide Christian. They may know a lot. They may know it all. They don't know it all. But the thing is, when they tell you something, listen intently because it's meant good. But go check it out. Verify it in the book. Teachers I've already mentioned. How about friends? Do you know how many people put their religious faith in a friend? My buddy goes down here to the so-and-so church. He's a good man. And I'm going to tell you right now, if it's good enough for him, it's good enough for me. He won't get it on Judgment Day. Even people we don't know. You know, I was a salesman most of my life. And I found out years and years and years ago. I could go talk to my family about something that I'm licensed in. And then, <laughs> sure, John, you don't know what you're talking about. And the day before, I had my suit on with my briefcase in hand. And I walked into a, a strange house I didn't know in a different city. I was the professional. I've had, well, you're the professional, Mr. Deck. You know, it's weird how we put so much faith in people we don't even know instead of the book. 1 Kings 13, 1 through 34. 
False confidence, boys. You got, you got. Don't be misled. Listen to this. This guy's Jeroboam, the king. He got in there and he built pagan altars. What's supposed to do that? Obviously. Uh, well, an angel told this man from Judah to go in there and prophesy to uh, to uh, uh, Jeroboam that the son of David. And by the way, Jeroboam he couldn't stand David. But the son of David, a boy named Josiah, would stand there in the very place where he was standing, and he would tear down all these false idols. He'd bring God stuff in, and you know what? Him and his people and all, they, they would be helpless. They couldn't help, they couldn't keep him from it. Well, this angel had told this guy to go tell him that. God told the man then when he got through to get out. Don't turn around, don't even look back. Get gone. Don't go back there no more. Well, he did exactly what he was told. Exactly what he was told. We're talking about putting your faith in the wrong thing instead of God. You'll get a false confidence that way. This man thought he was doing right. He did do right. Perfect. Until. All of a sudden there's this other man, this prophet, heard about all this. And... Uh, so he said, where, where is this guy at now? And they told him which way he went. Well, he runs him down. He said, hey, I'm a prophet. And an angel came to me and told me to tell you to come back to my house and eat. And uh, what did this guy from Judah do? Really? Okay. So he goes back. He comes back with him to eat. He returned. I thought God told you not to. Yeah, but this guy's a prophet and an angel told him to come and tell me to come back. That's the reason I did. The reason I go to this different name on this building here, not the church that Christ established in Acts chapter 2, is because my friend said, my mama said, my daddy said, my buddy said, won't get it. This guy here, this prophet said, then the angel, which is nothing but a liar, told the man from Judah he had disobeyed, disobeyed God's commands. An angel really did tell him to tell him that. And he also said, you won't even get to your father's burial grounds. Really? So the man from Judah wised up and he left. He left. He disobeyed God because he believed what this other guy said. How many on Judgment Day will go to hell because he said, she said, they said? We'd better go to the book. Better listen to God and God only. The man was eating by lion. So uh, people go by and they see there's lion standing there that killed the man. But he didn't eat his body up. He didn't even eat the donkey. I just see a big lion standing there going, I don't want to do it here. You know, he killed that guy. And here stands that donkey going, I ain't believing this, he's not eating me. And here's his corpse laying there for all these people. Well, the liar heard about it. He said, let's go find him. So they go down there and there it was. There it was. You know, of all people, the liar, the prophet that was a liar about that, he's the one that really started believing God. He's the one that really corrected himself. And you know, that's, that's good for him, except for one thing. What I saw when I read this, <laughs> that liar that straightened himself out caused another man to fall from God's commands. He was a stumbling block. And I want to tell you something, folks. I mean, that's with everything in my heart, mind, and soul. I want to go to heaven, but I do not want to be the cause of you not going to heaven. I don't want to be a stumbling block. And I hope and pray that you feel the same way. That's a good example of what not to be, the liar. 1 Timothy 4, 1 and 2 says, now the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, expressly says that in later times, I think we're there. 
Some will depart from the faith, giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of the demons themselves. That is such a sad verse because we know it's here. It is here not 100%, maybe 150%. Speaking lies in hypocrisy. Having their own conscience seared. In other words, they don't even have a conscience anymore. It's burnt. Done. If those two verses are not true, which they are, then we wouldn't have an extra 40,000 different man-made religions out there. 40,000? Some of them have twisted just a little bit, and some of them have gone completely wacko. There's just one, Ephesians 4, 4, and 5. Just one. The faith. The faith of Jesus Christ, the doctrine of Jesus Christ, and His Father who sent Him. Period. No more. We overly trust our own works. You don't know what all I do, preacher. I do so much it's not even funny. Many have false confidence because of what they do or have done years ago. I've done my share. It's time to make a seat here now. Oh, I've been there. I've done this. I've done that. Let somebody else go. Well, there ain't nobody else. When I was growing up, you remember the guy with the American tall hat on, Uncle Sam, saying, I just need one good man? We're there. We just need one good man. Huh. They seem to exalt themselves above common man. Somehow relying on their high standards or knowledge that they themselves have attained or used to practice. Ephesians 2 8 9 says, For by grace you have been saved. How? Through faith. By the grace of God, He owes you nothing. But because you have faith in His Word and you keep it, then you have grace. And that not of yourself, it's a gift from God, not of works. Romans 6, 3, Or do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into His death? So what message do we get out of that? We're to die to ourselves. And we're to live for Christ. When you came up out of the watery grave of baptism, you can put this on your refrigerator and remember it forever. When I was baptized and came up, it was not the end, it was the beginning. Because if I stopped right then, I won't make it. It's just the beginning of the rest of my life as a child of God. I've got to study, I've got to grow, I've got to love, I've got to teach, i got to commit 100% lest anyone should boast. you kidding yourself. Revelation 2.10 ends with, Be faithful when? Until death. The last dying breath. Well, I quit about 10 years ago, but I think I put enough time in. Hmm. Some are still living off their past, but yesterday is gone. And all we have is today. How many people have thrown their future away at the end of their lives? How many? We overly trust our relationship with God is another way. We, the church, tr over, over trust our relationship. Me and God have got a special understanding. Me and God have got a special relation. God's not a respecter of persons, buddy. Romans 3.18, there is no fear of God before their eyes. True. How about the two priests in Leviticus chapter 10, verse 1 and 2? Old Testament law, Moses priests. Man, they knew their stuff. They were on it all over the place. Built this, all this uh, sacrifice thing exactly the way it's supposed to be built. And they were close to God, and God was close to them, and they thought, you know what? I'm going to just do one little bitty thing extra. I've got everything just the way God told me to do it. I'm going to pour this canister of these oils on that fire so it'll smell better. And God will smell it. And he'll think, hey, you know what? Them old boys are special. I'm going to exalt them above everybody else. Might have been their thinking. 
and fire from that sacrifice consumed them immediately. I want you to try to figure out yourself where they are. I'll tell you something, guys. You can't be close enough to God to change anything in that book. You can't be close enough to God to come up with your own twist on religion. Your own banner that you're known for. We got to go by God's word and God's word only. No more, no less. <clears throat> People today might think just one little thing might not hurt them. Tell you what, let's do. Let's just put a little piano in here. That's too big. Well, let's just get a little guitar in here. Well, I don't like string instruments. Well, we'll put a bugle in here. We're just going. God's not going to send me to the wrong place just because I add one little thing. Don't add one thing to it. Not one thing to the book. It's not authorized. Yeah, but I thought we'd think. Start reading and studying and applying it. I have heard people say that they had a special relationship with God. Acts 10, 34 plainly blows that out of the water. Again, he is not a respecter of persons. I know better than anybody else and nobody in here is better than me or anybody else in here. We're all striving to get to heaven. We're God's children. Some of us need more help. Some of us need to help more. Some of us need to do more. But we all, we all need each other to confide in, to have fellowship with, to pray with each other, to sing with each other. Join hands and go to heaven again together one day, I hope. We only also trust our own knowledge. Hosea 4, 6, my people are destroyed by lack of knowledge. It don't say they didn't have any knowledge. You know, you can read a little bit and go off on the wrong trail. The more you read, the more you study, the more you learn, the more you're going to get out of everything. Some of you today have gotten a lot out of these sermons because you came to get a lot. You listen. And you're thinking, oh, wait a minute, John. Oh, wait a minute. That's great. Some can kind of go here, James Watkins, if you're still alive, not get nothing out of it. You'll get what you put in. I promise you that. How do we get the correct knowledge? How? First Timothy, Second Timothy 3, 16 and 17 says, Through all Scripture we become the man of God, complete and perfect. Now, all that scripture in there, do you know who it's written for? The Holy Spirit wrote it as He moved through man. It was written for those babes in Christ that got mature and they got to grow up. It was written for the lost out there. It was written for me. It was written for you. Preachers, elders, deacons, teachers, it don't matter. It, we need to study constantly. I've had people say, oh, John, I studied that Bible. I, 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 my eyes are turning orange, man. I, I can almost quote it. Then you need to study it some more. Don't lose in the end because of a false confidence. Hebrews 11.6 says, He's a rewarder of those who diligently, I mean really truly, from down deep in their hearts, seek Him. How can we see Him if we already know everything? There's no use in you saying, I'm seeking God if you're in your mind and in your heart thinking you don't need to, you already know it all anyway. If we're overconfident, we might be thinking. Now I'll put this in here just to be a little bit funny so don't get, don't get all upset and throw books. But I was thinking, you know, me and you, me and you may be the only ones, the two of us, that are going to go to heaven. Because we know so much, and I'm so good, and you're so good. And I'll be honest, I'm beginning to really worry about you. <laughs> Maybe I'm the only one. Maybe the real attitude of some people. While we can certainly have confidence, confidence in our salvation, the lesson is designed to remind all of us that we can also have a false confidence that can lead to our ruin. I'm okay with God. Are you sure? 
Yeah. Are you sure? Now remember, you're betting your eternal existence in heaven or hell by this answer. Are you all right with God in every way? To be honest, there's always something I could change. I hope you said that. To be honest, there's always more I could do and can do and ought to do, and I'm going to try to do. There's always some things I can sharpen myself up on. A lot. Me. And there's always some things I need to change in my life. Maybe it's my disposition. Maybe it's my attitude. Maybe it is my lack of commitment. Maybe it's my overcommitment. You could be overcommitted, yeah. You can come like a Pharisee. You're just better than you really think you are. For as by one man's disobedience, many were made sinners. Way to go, Adam. So by the obedience of one, many will be made righteous. Way to go, Jesus, our Savior. Deuteronomy 6.12 says to us and to them, Beware, this is the big one right here. This attacks that false confidence. Beware lest you forget the Lord who brought you out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage. All those people escaped bondage. They escaped through a sea that opened up on dry land. They did all this and it wasn't even long at all. They forgot God. People have raised up out of that baptismal. Christians! Maybe recently, maybe decades ago. But they forgot about the Lord. They forgot about the real works that you're supposed to have in your life. 2 Peter 1, 12-15. So, I'm going to mimic this and say I'm saying the same thing and I hope you're saying the same thing because we're all priests and saints. For this reason, I will not be negligent, church, to remind you always of these things. Though you know and are established in the present truth, you know a lot, just like I do. Yes, I think it is right as long as I am in this tent, in this body, to stir you up by reminding you and you stir me up and remind me too. Knowing that shortly I must put off my tent, I will leave this body and you will too. Just as the Lord Jesus Christ showed me, moreover, I will be careful to ensure that you always have a reminder of these things after my decease. Wouldn't it be wonderful that every one of us, when we left here, and all the rest of the family, is thinking about us being gone. And everyone in here, about each one of us, said something like, I love that person. They meant a lot to me. They were a great example to me on how a Christian needs to walk, talk, and think. I'd love to have that. And I know you would too. So the steps of salvation. Got it all laid out here pretty good. God has to do His part. God sent His Son to be killed on the cross of Calvary to shed His blood. The Holy Spirit wrote every bit of this in the book, the plan of salvation. All for me and you. Now I've got to hear that word and I've got to believe it with everything in me. I've got to then be able to repent of my sins and do something that this thing is talking about through the whole thing. To not have a false confidence to search my soul. Nobody can search my soul but God in me. I search my spirit and I see any faults. I need to correct them. And I can correct them if I'm a child of God in one breath. God, forgive me of this or that. It's so easy. Then and then only, I'll confess Jesus to the world and I'll to be baptized for the removal of my sins be added to the church of the Lord Himself. And then as most of us in here are already saints, I've got to remain faithful. Is there anything you need to correct in your life? If there is, we're fixing to stand and sing, come forward, or do it where you're sitting, depending on if it's public or not.